are listening to the CIA podcast. This episode is titled The State of Christian Education, an interview with Allison Heap. The Christians in America podcast is now on YouTube. You can listen free of charge at Christians in USA. Thank you and enjoy the ride. Well, everybody, I hope you're buckled in for a fantastic episode of the Christians in America podcast. Uh, As already stated, we have a special guest on the podcast. This is a a first for us in a number of ways. This is our first episode that will air on YouTube. It is also the first episode that we are recording over Zoom. So shout out to Zoom for some free advertisement there. Um, And shout out for making fantastic software that lets us connect with people all over the world. So with that being said, uh, one of the first topics we talked about on, I believe it was either our second or third episode of the podcast was where we see, you know, the church going and, and things going in the future. And one of the things we were curious to, to sort of see where it would go was education and specifically Christian education um, in the near future. So uh, we have a guest, Allison Heap, who has, is an, uh, an educator, and she has been willing to come on and sort of discuss that topic, dive into that topic with us here today. So Allison, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Josiah, and thank you, uh, Josiah and Jason, for having me. I am really excited to talk about education. It is my life. I love it. Um, And I love Christian education. My K through 12 education was really a hodgepodge of Christian options, a Christian school, traditional homeschooling using Christian curricula, um, a virtual Christian school, a Christian homeschool co-op, and um, a dual enrollment in a Christian university. I have a bachelor's degree in music education from Bob Jones University and a master's degree in teaching English as a second language from Grand Canyon University. Both are Christian institutions. Uh, During my undergrad, I was a teacher's aide in a Christian school, but I did my student teaching in a public school, and I just really wanted to stay and be a light, so I've taught in public education system ever since, and my time in the public education system has piqued my interest in educational systems and policy, which I do hope to study more in the future, and last summer, I was able to intern in the legislative office of the American Association of Christian Schools in Washington, D.C., so I'm excited to share some of what I learned in that experience with you today. Yeah, really. So what um, sort of explain to the audience, what, what, what is that internship like? What did you get to do? Um, what, what are they doing as, a, as an organization? So the American Association of Christian Schools is a network of state associations of Christian schools that uh, they... They work to um, just organize and provide more opportunities for those smaller Christian schools to pull their resources. So the American Association of Christian Schools has this legislative office in D.C. where they just try to really keep their finger on the pulse of the nation and figure out what's going on in D.C., especially at the Department of Education. They really monitor issues about religious freedom and education in general. And uh, so my internship, I did a lot of research on, um, especially with COVID going on this summer, I did a lot of research on the CARES Act and how that funding would be rolled out to schools, especially uh, to private schools. And uh, we did a lot of just reading and studying, you know, the American government system and the history of education. We read The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis, which is now my favorite book of all time, even though I probably understand about 10% of it. (laughs) And, uh, it was a really good experience. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, let's jump into it. And um, I'm not sure, Allison, if you've if you've seen any of our episodes, but we love to talk about uh, hypothetical futures. So the first question is really, or topic is really about that. In a perfect world, what would biblically sound? What would a biblically sound learning environment be like? Well, I, re- I have enjoyed uh, listening to your episodes so far, and I, I get your uh, hypotheticals. I think I have some context for that. So um, 
I guess I'll just start where it really matters in the Bible. And the vast majority of instances of the word teach or instruct in the Bible refer to the passing on of the knowledge of God, his creation, his works, his word. And God, I believe, intended education to be the way that we get to know him. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. I mean, that's why we have the STEM subjects to study his creation, because it helps us to see the invisible things of God. And if you read Deuteronomy 11, you sort of get an abridged version of the Pentateuch, God's work in you know, the lives of the children of Israel. And then God says to teach those things to your children in your house, out and about in the morning, at night, write them on the doors and on the gates and in your house. And he commands us to saturate our families in God's word and teach them of the ways that he's worked in human history. That's what we, why we study history. That's why we study the other social sciences to understand God better. We learn the devices of English and other languages in um, language classes so that we can understand God through his word and testify of God's working in our lives to others. If we want to imagine Christian education in a perfect world, I mean, we really wouldn't have to make the disti distinction of Christian education because all education would be Christian and all education would lead us to God and we would be in perfect fellowship with God and there would be no sin as it was in the Garden of Eden. And now, obviously, we don't live in a perfect, sinless world. So under our current circumstances, there are ideals that I think we should be striving for and praying for in the church today. Um, I, I think I can boil it down to really three things. Uh, ideally, parents would, you know, obey Deuteronomy 11. They take responsibility for educating their children in the knowledge of God. They're the primary educators and while schools and educational services are sort of contractors, parents employ to educate their children. Uh, the parents provide a biblically faithful, rigorous education at home through whichever contractors they choose. Um, and ideally, families can afford and access a biblically faithful education. And that opens up the topic of school choice, which is a totally different discussion. But um, that is definitely something that I think about when I think of Christian education. And finally, ideally, uh, legislation would give Christians freedom to operate independently in their schools and thus unashamedly adhere to the Bible in the operations of their schools and uh, to teach and hold their staff to and their students to biblical principles. Wow, that was a really um, in-depth response. I like though that you intentionally went out of your way to point that every form of education in a perfect hypothetical world would be a quote unquote Christian education. I mean, when you, when you really examine the motives for why, um, why we study in school or why we do our homework, um, I went to an online charter school go, growing up and that was, you know, it, it's really, it's all about really me doing better and me um, just like gaining more knowledge for my sake and for my future and my betterment. But I think when we really pause and meditate on what it actually means to educate ourselves, it's really not for ourselves. It's more for God's glory. And the more we know, the more we can help others and the more we can glorify God in our knowledge of this world. And um, I mean, when you just look at, I'm a big astronomy person. And when you examine like the stars and you examine all the different like aspects of the solar system and everything coming together, it's just like, it all points back to God for me. And it's so sad when, <laughs> I mean, I took an astronomy class in college and it's so sad because it's like, it literally, they use it all to point towards like an evolutionary, uh, you know, a uh, non-theistic uh, worldview and it's this this atheistic um kind of motive behind us examining the solar system and it's just it's so sad because they miss the point of why it's out there and they misuse our knowledge and their motives are just so not on board with what a proper i guess wisdom would be and then yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, and uh, so a public charter school, you know, is I'm really just a public school and our public education system sort of purports itself to be neutral. And um, it makes me think of an R.C. Sproul 
quote, which is that uh, he said, there is no such thing as a neutral education. By being neutral, you've stopped being neutral. You've made a decision that God is out of bounds here. And so, uh, you know, public education, a lot of times I think people think of it as uh, a place where, you know, it's, it's pluralistic, you're just learning the facts, and then you get to decide what lens you're going to view it through, but you really can't do that. Once you take God out of the equation, you've made that decision that you're going to look at it through a different view. Yeah, and, uh, you know, just to, to build on that, I've heard it said that there, you know, God wrote two books and obviously the first book being and the main book being, in the, you know, his word, the, the Bible, but then he also has written his instructions um, in nature. I, I think of the beginning of Romans and Paul's just fantastic uh, discussion on how, you know, natural things and, and nobody is, is guiltless because um, they know, they know God through nature and and that does seem to be at least from an outsider's point of view seems to be becoming perverted in in insane ways in the american system i mean you, your uh, educational system even take something outside the educational system um just like the the fitness and dieting industry they always go back to well this was how our body our ancestors bodies were built through the evolutionary process or um, and that's why we need to do these things and and even in something as random as as fitness and wellness that it, it's been taken out so really to to transition us onto our next sort of thing where has christianity been from an outsider asking an insider i guess where has christianity been uh the last few years in regards to to education well you know um the the trump administration really worked to protect christian schools especially during covid and uh, President Trump and formal, former Education Secretary Betsy DeVos really made it clear that they respected religious liberty, both here and abroad. And under DeVos, the Department of Education, recognizing that COVID really affected every American family and that a lot of private schools service low-income communities, released guidance on uh, the use of the CARES Act funding that gave governors the option to direct more of their funding to students in non-public schools. Unfortunately, because it was guidance from a federal agency and not passed by Congress, not law, it was not legally binding. And there was several legal battles in states where governors did try to direct some of this funding to private schools and to families for private school tuition. That happened here in South Carolina and our Supreme Court ruled that the money could not go to, to uh, families to pay for private school tuition because of our Blaine Amendment, which says public funds cannot go to private schools. But um, speaking of Blaine Amendments, I mean, there's been some legal victories for Christian schools as well. Uh, this past summer, the Supreme Court sided with families choosing Christian schools uh, in the case of Espinoza versus the Montana Department of Revenue. And under the cover of this Blaine Amendment in the Montana's in Montana state constitution, the Department of Revenue denied tax credit scholarships to three families since they intended to use them at a Christian school. Um, and the proposed, I'm sorry, um, the Supreme Court ruled that the Montana Department of Revenue was discriminating against those three families on the basis of religion and that the Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which you may hear called RIFRA, and the free exercise clause in the First Amendment protected their right to participate in this neutral public program. So RIFRA trumped the Blaine Amendment, which set a precedent that could topple other states' Blaine Amendments. And then as well, um, there was another legal victory this summer, and that was Our, um, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Guadalupe excuse me, School versus Morrissey Baru. Uh, in which the school, I'm uh, sorry, the Supreme Court ruled that the government cannot interfere in a religious school's hiring and firing decisions for a teaching position with significant religious responsibilities. And, you know, based on our understanding of Christian education as teaching children about God, we would say that every Christian school teacher has significant religious responsibilities. And the special status uh, as a teacher of religion has been dubbed the ministerial exception. And it, this is really encouraging because 
it was decided seven to two. So seven of our highest judges in the land recognized that for Christian schools, education is inseparable from, from faith. And they recognize the right of Christian schools to follow the teachings of the Bible when it comes to choosing educators for our children. Uh, and now that Justice Amy Coney Barrett has replaced the dissenting late uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I would imagine that the ruling would be eight to one. So I, you, you can really understand why people are on the far left are calling for court packing right now. And we should certainly pray that doesn't happen. But we've definitely we've seen some ups and downs and um, definitely Christian schools are are still going strong. And I think a lot of families are moving from public schools to Christian schools now just because so many public schools are closed or they're, you know, doing a hybrid program, or uh, the families just are uncomfortable with the uh, way that their public schools are handling COVID. Wow, that's interesting. So it actually, um, at least it sounds like we're, there's some optimism to be had, and it's not all just uh, just doom and gloom in, in what's happening in the modern, you know, times. Playing off that then, I guess, where in all this on all these legal battles and all these court cases and and everything going on where has christian education like the nuts and bolts has it been going up lately has it been sort of trending down in a way what sort of you know has there been i know i mean there's been so many legal struggles but has there been like any like as for institutions, as whether that be, you know, more Christian schools, or um, I guess I, I, it, it would really be hard to, to, to get Christian curriculum into a public school, but like, like, even neutral curriculum, um, things like that. Has, has, have there been any, any good news in those fronts and any bad news? Has it been all falling away? Um, things of that nature. I definitely would not say that it's falling away. I would say we're seeing as public schools become more and more secular, we are seeing some of that in some Christian schools. I mean, I saw an article earlier today, um, a headline, I didn't stop and read the article, but I saw a headline saying something about how more Christian schools are adopting uh, secular curricula instead of using Christian curricula, you know, using secular textbooks. And even in my, um, my Christian education at a Christian college, I definitely used a lot of secular materials. And I'm not saying you can't use a secular textbook and look at it from a Christian perspective, but it is very interesting that we are seeing increased use of those secular textbooks. And I think, I think a lot of it is there's pushback against uh, Christian curricula right now. Um, for example, there's a HuffPost reporter named Rebecca Klein, who recently wrote an article that was very critical of BJU Press, that's Bob Jones University Press, and a Becca, another Christian curriculum that comes from Pensacola Christian College. And uh, she, she really went at it from uh, a very secular perspective, and she called out the publishers for publishing things that she disagreed with, and she made a lot of people angry, and they started calling for people to reject BJU Press and uh, uh, Becca, and while I might not agree with everything in a BJU Press textbook or everything in a Becca textbook, um, a lot of it was just attacking Christian ideas, and I think that is probably part of the reason why we're seeing this move away from Christian curricula. I would say probably those are the two biggest companies. Um, I would imagine probably you've heard of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, I've also heard a lot from people who profess to be Christians and they most likely are at my workplace. And I've actually had discussions with them almost about this topic and I hear a lot of times they, they, they would say something like, I would like my, my child to go to a Christian school, but I don't know if their curriculum is as informed as like a secular organization or a brick and mortar school or a public school. And it's like, 
like you have to wonder like is that the thought in the educational realm where it's like they somehow have this notion that just because it's a christian curriculum it's not as informed and not as i guess um advanced as some of their secular um tools yeah and i would definitely push back against that i think that a lot of uh, a lot of what we're seeing in public schools and just in secular education in general is a trend toward just this very utilitarian model of education where you just need to learn what you need to know to do your job. Um, in, in my district, we focus a lot on having kids be college and career ready by graduation. And so it's not about learning about things that are uh, I'm trying to think of the, the words in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is honest, just pure, lovely, of good report. It's not about learning things to understand the world that God has created for us. It's not about learning things to understand truth and b- to see beauty. It's about knowing things that you can use for a certain purpose. And a lot of Christians are turning to a classical model of education, which is very rigorous. Uh, a lot of classical education models include, you know, Aristotle and Plato, uh, you know, those original texts and they learn Latin and are, it, it's a very, a very uh, hearty <laughs> curricula. And, um, you know, our public schools are tr- trying to teach kids just an, just what they need to know to be quote unquote successful in life and not teach them to appreciate learning for the, the sake of appreciating learning. Mm. Yeah. So sort of circling back, but also in, including what Jason brought up there, ha, where has this, like, where, or has this mindset just happened gradually or so, or have like Christians somehow maybe, like shot themselves in the foot uh, when it comes to education in some ways. Uh, the, the reason I ask is my background in politics. Um, Christian political organizing has notoriously been very selfish and very antagonistic to being cooperative with um, whether it be a political party or whether it be a campaign. It's very much a, uh, we're going to help you, but you have to, really make us look good in the sense so i'm just curious is it something similar to that has that happened within christian education that has maybe caused a um a such such a divide and such a we're going to go fully away from um from any even christian schools teaching christian curriculum within the school um is has any of that come into play at all You know, I, I would say that part of, part of the reason why you see this sort of falling away from this really biblical, biblically faithful education is probably just motivation to stay alive. (laughs) You know, there's a lot of Christian schools that are losing students to public schools because they've it's it's a it's a vicious cycle I guess if you start falling away from being something really distinct if you start becoming more like the public schools then families aren't going to pay five thousand dollars a year to send their kid to your school when they could send their kid to a public school for free and essentially get the same thing so as when public school families start sending, or I'm sorry, when Christian school families start sending their kids to public school, I've, I've noticed that, you know, you, you start seeing even more secularization as a response, and it's just perpetuating the cycle. It's not helping them to gain any students back, but it's almost this attempt to attract more people in just this way that it's, you know, we're, we're relatable, we're relevant, we're, you know, more like the, and they think that's what people want, but those families that are leaving, 
they don't want a school that's more like the public school. They want a school that's distinct. That's why they'll pay tuition. And so, yes, in some ways, I do feel like Christian schools are sort of <laughs> shooting themselves in the foot. Um, and I'm not sure that many are seeing this cycle happen. Sounds, uh, sounds very eerily similar to what's happening in the church itself um, with the, uh, all right, do we conform? Do we, uh, do we make ourselves um, culturally relevant? Do we uh, do all that or, or do, do, we, do we be biblically based? And I, I think we're, we're maybe seeing some of the same things. So uh, transitioning on here to our, to our final topic, uh, which is what do you see, once again, sort of going back to that hypothetical, but wh what do you see uh, in th through the end of 2021 and, and into the future? Where do you see Christians in education going? Where do you see Christian education going? Just what, uh, what, what do you think? What are your predictions on, in that regard? Well, I think in some ways... Well, you know, the like I said, the Trump administration was friendly to um, Christian education. Betsy DeVos was friendly to Christian education and made it a little bit easier for Christian schools to operate independently. And I think as uh, the new in administration comes in and we have a new education secretary, uh, you know, we've already seen signals that it's going to be very different. And I think in, in a way that will almost pure, kind of purify <laughs> Christian education. You know, when, when, and I'm not saying that, you know, we have it very good here. There are, there are countries where there is real, very tangible persecution. And if the worst that we have to go through is, you know, we have to work around some, re some extra government regulations, then we'll still have it really, really good. But the harder times get for Christians, the more you really see who's devoted to the Lord and who is sort of doing it as a, this is part of my culture or who, um, you know, if this is a tradition for me or just something nice that I, you know, I go to church on Sundays and it's a nice thing. And, uh, or I put my kid in a Christian school because it's a, a nice school. The people are nice to my kid. The teachers are nice, you know, and, um, or even the, the education is much better quality than the public schools. But I think we're going to start see, seeing Christian schools realize um, if they start to bend on more and more principles that they really are no different than public schools. And they're going to have to, some of them close their doors because they're going to lose even more students. And so I think we're going to see probably we may see some Christian schools close their doors for that reason, but we'll also see some sort of shore up. This is what we believe. This is what we're standing on and we're not going to waver on it and come what may we're going to stick to it. And I think a lot of parents will, will go to them and will support them and put their children in those schools and, really get behind them because they'll, they'll, there will be sort of even more this, this even more stark divide between the public education system as it goes further away from, um, from the Bible and from Christian teachings. And as Christian schools become more faithful to the Bible and really sure up their teachings and their beliefs, I think that divide will definitely widen a little more. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> once again, it's very similar to the church itself, I think, um, and what's coming that way. So surprisingly, um, at least a surprise to me and Jason, we do, we get a lot of um, parents that listen to our, our podcast. And so just thinking, Christian education at its basics for a child, say like just a, a beginning school age child, what would be some just practical recommendations to get somebody like a young person just grounded in a solid biblical foundation for their worldview um, and, and just to go into any learning environment outside the, the home? Do you have any uh, just sort of recommendations there or places to start? Sure. 
Well, first of all, I think it's really important to know uh, what what is coming as far as what um, what legislation is going to affect Christian education and what um, cultural issues are going to affect Christian education are going to affect Christian education and. So the American Association of Christian Schools has a really great podcast that talks about issues in education, things that will affect Christian education, will affect children, will affect Christian families. Um, They have a great podcast. They also have a publication called the Washington Flyer from their legislative office that talks about those things. So that I think will help parents to know what's coming and sort of keep their finger on the pulse of what's happening, happening politically and culturally. And then I would encourage, I mean, I used BJU Press textbooks and Abeka textbooks growing up, and it's not just for homeschooling families. There are other publications um, from those two companies that are, you know, textbooks on the Bible, textbooks on apologetics, um, just books to read that I think will really fortify a child's beliefs and child's Christian education. I think being involved in your local church and taking your child to Sunday school, even if it's early, even, you know, take, even if it's hard to get them to Awana or youth group or whatever on, on Wednesday nights, really ensuring that they are hearing the Bible every chance that you can get them and in those kind of situations is really important. And just reading with your child at home. This concludes part one of our interview with Allison Heap. The rest of this interview can be exclusively found at Christians in USA on YouTube. This is Jason Costello for the Christians in America podcast signing off. <laughs>